Welcome to Church of the Rock Online. We are so happy that you've joined us today. If this is your first time joining us, please jump into the chat and say hi. Let us know where you're joining us from. And if you have any questions throughout the service or if you'd like someone to pray with you, just let them know in the chat. We have wonderful, friendly hosts that are standing by and they can't wait to connect with you. Well, I know that the praise team is eager to get started, so let's head backstage and join Lindley for Backstage Pass. Hey everyone, welcome to Backstage Pass. You're with me, your host, Lindley Lapunga, and today I'm joined by Pastor Andrew Campbell. Welcome, Pastor Andrew. Thanks, Lindley, for inviting me. Good to oh, be with you all. All the way from the North End, hey? That's right. So I know a topic which you've preached about both here at Winnipeg South and in the North End has been friendship, because friendship is something super important to you. So why don't you tell us, you know, why is that a topic which you absolutely love? Uh, yeah, for sure. So. There's three main reasons. Uh, get through this really quick. First, in the Gospel of John, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he says, I no longer call you slaves. I call you my friends. So we are called to relate to Jesus as friends. Also, in uh, the Christian life, the brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, we are called to relate to each other as friends as well. It's not quite so clearly cut and dry as what Jesus just said, but uh, hospitality, the idea of encouragement and letting, uh, you know, the, the uh, lawsuits go to the side. Don't even bring that up. You know, that is all about uh, being friends with one another. And then third, of course, is sort of uh, evangelistic sense, uh, being friends with the lost. I mean, most people, uh, here and those of you watching you are a Christian because of someone close to you a friend that made you interested piqued your curiosity about Christ and uh, journeyed with you into your salvation right and you know it's interesting you're someone who wears a lot of hats here a father a husband your pastor um, but how do, how do you make time to have all these friends what does friendship look like in your life uh, that's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> because there's the community sense mm -hmm. of friendship uh, in the church community, having people to our homes. And then there's like a, a personal sense of friendship where we really have to work hard to fight for those connections uh, with friends that um, are sort of are on another level. And we don't need to be ashamed of having like a church community and a closer knit circle of friends, um, but finding that time is a challenge and you really have to make it a priority, which it should be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there are seasons where you adjust and maybe, you know, you're only available for a certain amount, but always keeping those people in your life. Yes. Now, today we're going to be centering on a, an aspect of friendship, which is neighboring. Um, so why don't you tell us what is neighboring and how did you start neighboring? Uh, well, neighboring is just getting to know people mm -hmm. and kind of for the sake of getting to know them. Um, and we often think about that as people living on the same street, but it can also be a, a coworker that you aren't necessarily working directly with, or maybe you are. Um, I think the first thing you need to do is get to know their names, mm. right? Uh, often uh, we see people on the street, on, living in the same neighborhood, but we don't know their names. And uh, it's something you really have to work hard at. I, people say to me, you're so good at remembering names. Well, there's no secret about it. It's hard work. You have to commit to doing it. And one thing I do is that the first few sentences that they're talking, usually it's not the most important stuff that they're saying. So I repeat their name to myself in my head like 10 times during that first 10 seconds. And it helps me a lot. Right. It's hard work. Right. So are you, would you say that you're someone who's friends with your, with your neighbors? I think so. Yeah. And how did you how did you start that? Was it awkward or what was that like for you? Um, you know, having kids is uh, <laughs> definitely help because they are a lot more extroverted uh, in the community than I would naturally be. Uh, but also being able to connect with people that are older than myself and and that kind of thing, just being out on the street, being available and, um, you know, connecting in little ways that aren't super uh, deep, but ways that build up a bit of a rapport with people right. in your neighborhood. Right. So yeah, you hear that? If you have kids, they can be your icebreaker, right? That's, that's the way it's worked often for us. <laughs> and what benefits have you seen from actually getting to know your neighbors and people in your direct community? Uh, as far as benefits, there's been a, a few for sure. One is just a, a safer, a sense of 
safety in the neighborhood. You know the people that are around you. You know that they generally have good intent towards you, just like I have towards them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we go on vacation, they look out for our property. And when they go, they tell us so we can look out for their property and that kind of thing. And uh, it's been really great that way. You know, our, our kids especially have become really endeared to some of the grandparent types on the, in the neighborhood. And just th this past Monday was Halloween. And so we went walking around the neighborhood collecting candy. And uh, a number of them had specific things set aside for our kids, more than what other kids might be getting. Wow. And you know that shouldn't be necessarily the reason that you become friends with your neighbors, but there are benefits too. Right, and I think in a world where you know, we're constantly looking for community and constantly looking for friends, oftentimes you know, the first step is literally down the street or you know, to the house to the left. So thank you so much for sharing about just the power of neighboring and how easy it can be. And thank you guys for joining us for Backstage Pass. Up next, we've got the service. Well, good morning, church. Welcome to our service this morning. We're so glad that you've come and uh, are here today with us in person for those of you that are here in the room. And we're also excited for those of you that are joining us online. Thank you for coming and, and being part of our service. Let's give them a big warm welcome. And we've got our choir back this morning. We're, yeah, we're excited about that. They're going to help, help us lead and worship today. So let's get right into it. Why don't we stand? Go ahead and find somebody. Greet them. Welcome them here. And then we're going to jump right in.
as it gets When I was young I didn't know him yet He called me But I miss calls all the time I miss calls all the time The time I think he knew Someday he'd get through But he left that call be mine My faith was as small as it gets But Jesus wasn't my savior yet He called me when I was doing my thing Set me free. Hey. All right, here we go. My life is as good as it gets. I'm changed, I feel alive and less. He called me, and now I'm living for him. Now I believe, and I fall on my knees. It's Jesus. Anybody here free today? Yeah, amen. Well, kids, we're going to set you free. You can go to Kids Rock right now, have a great time, and we're going to continue to worship here.
Celebrating Remembrance Day, uh, as you know, it's this week, and I want to do two things today. And the very first thing I want to do is we're going to take a moment of silence and just remember those who have given their lives for this country and have given us a place of freedom and of peace. So let's just take a moment of silence here and remember them. Thank you, Lord, for the lives that you have given and that you have given us, Lord, for, the, for um, all this time, Lord. We just are so grateful for those who sacrifice themselves for this country. And uh, the second thing I want to do here is I want everyone who has served in the armed forces to stay standing. I want the rest of us to have a seat so we can acknowledge these people either who have been or are currently a part of the armed forces. Do we have anyone here? We have a few people here today. Let's give them a big hand, shall we? And for those standing, I just want to pray a blessing over you. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these men and these women, Lord, who are serving for a purpose greater than themselves. They're serving for their country, and they're serving for you, Lord, because the battle belongs to you. And Lord, we are so grateful for all the sacrifice uh, that 
that these men and women have done for their Lord. They've sacrificed family. They've sacrificed time. They've sacrificed so much so that you can do through them uh, what what you want, Lord. And we are just so grateful, Lord, about everything they have given up, Lord. And we pray your blessing over them. And we are so thankful for these men and women who are serving just for you, Lord. And they're serving for a greater cause. They're serving for their king. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's give them one more hand, shall we? Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome to Church of the Rock. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Feel free to say hi in the chat. We'd love to hear where you're chatting from. And if you dressed up this week, why don't you tell us what costume did you have? <laughs> or maybe even post a picture, exactly. even better. That would be super fun. Well, coming up this Monday, we are continuing on with our Monday night online small group. And they were continuing on with our Max On Life series with Max Licato. And we're just enjoying his, his studies and answering all of these tough questions. And uh, tomorrow night, super light topic. We're going to be talking about life after death, Lily. Wow. <laughs> it's so light. Oh, yeah. So, you know, heaven, hell, who goes where, <laughs> what you want, everything you want to know about life after death, Max Licato is going to uh, tackle all of those questions, and you are more than welcome to join us. Once again, that's on live uh, tomorrow night, 8.30 p.m. Central Time at more.churchoftherock.live. We'd love to have you join us. And I'm sure you're going to have such great discussions with that topic. And on a different note, seeing as we are are approaching Christmas already. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy, but it's November. It's, yep. it's that time. Yeah. So Junia Link, which is a women's ministry here at Church of the Rock, is starting off with an Advent study. So that's going to be starting this Thursday, and it's available both online and in person. So if you're in the Winnipeg area, you can always come in person. And if you're online, you can visit churchoftherock.ca slash Junia for more information on how to get access there. Yeah, we'll get you the, the, uh, the Zoom link, and then you can join us from wherever you happen to be. But it is crazy to wrap your head around on the fact that we're talking Advent and Christmas already, but since that is just around the corner, we want to encourage you to save the date for a very special Christmas event that we have coming up here in person at the church. It's called Laughing All the Way with our favorite comedian, Matt Falk. It's going to be a dessert night, and that's on Sunday, December 11th. So if you're in the Winnipeg area, we'd love to have you join us. Just circle that date on your calendar. Right, and if you're not, we know Backstage Pass, we were talking about neighboring, and so maybe you can invite a few people over and watch something funny together, have your own dessert night, which is, would be so fantastic. I love that idea. Now, if you want to make sure you don't miss anything that's coming up over the next several weeks, make sure that you're on our email list. If you're not already receiving regular emails about what's happening online, just email me at online at churchoftherock.ca and let me know that you'd like to be put on the list and that way you'll get the emails and you won't miss a single event coming up. And lastly, we'd like to thank you all for giving. We know that you've given so generously and faithfully throughout the whole year. And if you're new to the website and trying to figure out how do I give, you can always go to churchoftherock.ca slash give, and there are instructions on how to give there. Absolutely. Well, it's time to get back into the service, so let's rejoin them for today's message. Right. How are we today? Good. Great. How many had a terrible? No, don't say that. Hey, it's so good. By the end of this message, you're going to be so encouraged. If you had like the worst day in the worst week and you showed up here, that was perfect. You're going to get exactly what we want. Hey, before we go too far, we want to welcome all of our campuses and our online people, uh, North End Campus, Bronx Park Campus, Niverville Campus, the gang from Morse, Manitoba. I was preaching there live, Morse, to you guys, and they said, I've always wanted to be part of a gang. <laughs> so they love that. So let's give all of them a cheer. All right, we are going to spend the next few weeks looking at God encounters that people had and when God got really close to some people and uh, when he did that, there was something that he had for them that he met them right where they were at. God came and he didn't chastise these people. He didn't uh, give them grief over what they were going through. He actually came and he met them right where they were at and gave them exactly what they needed in that point. Elijah had a cave. 
Jacob had a ladder, Moses had a bush, uh, uh, Paul had a light, Peter had a sheet that came down, and God came and he tailored his message just for them because there was something that they needed. Every one of those people that I just mentioned and a whole bunch more were going through stuff like you go through. Doubts, fears, frustrations, struggles. Hey, this isn't fair. There's an injustice here. And they got into a place that you and I get into where we get overwhelmed occasionally by those things. How many of you have ever doubted in your life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to put up your hand. All the time. In the morning, I was telling my wife this, you know, morning, I remember waking up one time and thinking, I'm not even sure I'm saved. And then I took a cup of coffee, and then I was fine. <laughs> no, that's not the answer of this message. But you know what? All of us have those moments in our life where we struggle with these things. And we're going to take, a, we're going to take some time. We're going to look through the scripture and say that, hey, you know what? When God met those people and he gave them this God encounter, there was something really specific that he did. And not only did he show up. And sometimes when he showed up, it was amazing, right? It's called a theophany if you go to Bible school. And it's like you have these lightning and thunder and crashing. And it's like, and God comes and it's like, but you know what? It wasn't just that. Every time he did this, he did something that's so incredibly important. He said words like this, I am your defender. I am your shield. I am your rear guard. I am your strong tower. In fact, do you know that 300 times in the Bible, God says, I am. 300 times. And we're going to look at actually the first time that he said that. And when he says, I am, what he wants to communicate to you is, this is who I am. Now you can get this. Because this is his gift for you. When God shows up, sometimes he shows up in that big, strong way. Sometimes he shows up differently. I, I don't know if you've ever thought of this. When you were thinking about the resurrection, and we have these, when we do our Easter plays, there's these grand moments and everything. And, and I was thinking about, you know, the Marvel version of, of kind of like our Easter plays that we do and everything like that. Where if you're, if you're making a movie out of this, you know, he's the resurrection and the life, Right? So here is the perfect scene that he has. You can just see he's been dead for three days and the rock starts moving and there's smoke that starts happening and there's lightning that starts crashing all over the place. And then the rock just goes and Jesus dumps out and he goes, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, that is the way I would do it if I was writing the script. Pretty cool, right? We like this. <laughs> but you know what he did instead? There are some ladies who didn't and weren't expecting that he was going to rise from the dead. They just loved him with all their hearts. And he came almost like he wasn't supposed to, but he couldn't help himself. And he came to them. And he just said, hey, I'm alive. And it was so quiet. And it was so perfect. You see, God wants to meet you right in the middle of your doubts. And that's the first thing that we're going to talk about this week. And, and he's going to tailor it so it's incredibly meaningful for you. And he's going to come and meet you right in that place. You just need to be willing to take that. So we're going to, we're going to take a look at Abram, who becomes Abraham, and see what his God encounter is. And as we look at the Old Testament, there are a couple things you've got to remember. The Old Testament is like this beautiful room with furnishings and everything's great, but it's a little dim. And you always need the New Testament to shine the light on it, because then you get what it really looks like. Okay? Everything in the New Testament points to Jesus. We got this? So that's how you read the Old Testament. And so there's a story in the Old Testament that's, that is, talks about Abram. And uh, Abram was, had his lot, his, his relative, who he's just gone, and he's rescued from four different kings that lived around him. And as he's finished this rescue, 
we just sort of pick up the story in Genesis 14. This is going to be the precursor for us to get into where we're going. It says, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Whoever was the conquering king get to keep everything. So I'm not sure why he thinks he could negotiate, but there we go. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord most high, the creator of heaven and earth. Abram didn't even kind of get God totally, but this part he got. And he said, I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread on the strap of my sandal, okay, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. What does, Abram actually at this point doesn't even know that there's just one God. He's sort of figuring out who God is. What does he know about God for sure? I am your provider. That part he's got. And he's absolutely convinced of this. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to let you do this. I'm not going to let you give me stuff. And you say, God is going to provide. So he's got that part down. And you think, well, this guy's pretty good, right? Father of faith, he, he does that. But as we move on in the passage, we see that there's a whole nother part to it in, in chapter 15. And it says, after this, so it's like really, really close. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He is about to have a close encounter with God. And he hasn't had one of these before. And this is what God says. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and I'm your great reward. Abram, he says, I want you to get something because here's what was happening that we know from history is that Abraham had just taken all of these, these um, <clears throat> got lot back and done this. And he was a little afraid of the kings coming and doing retribution. And God says, okay, Abram, I'm your shield. You're good. And it's almost like Abram goes, okay, I got that. Then he says, I am your great reward. I am your great reward. Sometimes I think when we think about rewards, we think about stuff. That's sort of the world's way of thinking, right? And there's a whole gospel built around rewards. It's, it's, there's some really bad versions of the prosperity gospel that think that your, your reward is this stuff over here. And God says, Abram, I want you to get this, and this is, might be the most important thing you get. I am your reward. I'm your reward, Abram. And I think he spent the rest of his life understanding what that really meant. And I think for you and I, there's something incredible here. God says, I am your reward. Your pres my presence, my power, my promises, all of those 300 I am's. He says, you know what? I'm your reward. Now, what are you going to seek after? And so Abraham begins this encounter with God where God comes down in a vision and he sees this and, and he gets to talk in his visions. Does that ever happen to you? Where you had a vision and you get to talk with God? Seems very cool, right? Usually I'm in my visions are more like pizza visions and it doesn't go like that. But Abraham has this amazing vision and he says, but Abraham said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is El Hazar of Damascus. And uh, basically what was happening is the thing that was most important to Abram, like that he would have a family. You know, yeah, he got Lot back and God says, I'm going to be your reward. And Abram begins to get his doubts out. And this is one of the things that I think is really important for us. You and I need to learn how to deal with our doubts. And denying them isn't what we need. Actually shouting them down probably isn't going to work. Going to that place of just saying, you know, I'm just going to believe this. And I believe this. Well, that's good. Sometimes that works. But if you're really doubting on something deep, you need something way better and fuller and deeper than that to de deal with your doubts. And God gives this great promise, but then he says, to, and then Abraham comes up with it, and he says, okay, here's what it really is. I'm living my life, and every day as I live my life, I see this Elhazer guy walking around. I'm thinking, he gets everything, and I have no kids. And in our culture, that may not be the same thing, but in that culture, that was everything, is what they got to pass down their blessings, what they got to give. And he was saying, man, I got some doubts. Because I know, God, you said you're going to be my shield. I know you said you're going to be all those things. But I'm not sure what I can do. 
And in the middle of it, he says, I am going to give you something that you are going to be able to understand this, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. So his doubts are there. And this is what he says, I have doubts. And God answers his doubts this way. He says, I want you to look up at the sky, and I want you to count the stars. And if indeed you can count them, so he said, so shall your offspring be. I want to give you a little visual of this. There we go. Okay, the people on this side, I want you to start counting the stars from the bottom left corner. And the people, right? And God says to Abram, I want you to think about this. And I want you to get a visual of this, Abraham. I've given you a promise, but I also give you something. And you know what, friends? This is exactly what God does to us. He gives us something that puts a stamp on it. And says, you know what, I know you're doubting. He doesn't trash him for his doubts, but he gives him this picture. Now, every time Abram would come out of his tent and he would see the night sky, what would he think about? The promise of God. That Elhazar guy, forget about him. Every one of those stars is like the ancestors that I'm going to bring you. I am who I am. Those words resonated and pounded in Abram's chest because he is the almighty God. And he's spoken a word and he gave him a picture. Now we could end the sermon here, folks. And we go, oh, isn't that nice? Abraham says, yeah, I got got doubts about you. And God says, no, you don't have to doubt me. Here we go. But then something happens and Abraham realizes something that I think is pretty profound he realizes that he actually has doubts about himself. You know, I really don't doubt God as much as I doubt me. You too? Where you look and we go, oh yeah, you know, I know those promises, and I know you're this, and I know you're that, but I kind of know who I am. And I doubt myself. And in the second part of it, God gives him a second answer. In verse 7 he says, He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur to the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. And he says, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? I'm still doubting. I know you said it. I know. I got the whole star thing. That seems great. And he says, the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, a dove, and a pigeon. And and he brought all these things, and he cut them in half, and he arranged them half opposites of each other, the birds. He didn't cut in half. Then the birds and the prey came down the carcasses, and Adam drove them away. So when we read this, we think, okay, that's a bit weird. That God has a very bad pet thing going on. <laughs> he just slept. And, and, uh, but for, when God said that to Abram, it was very obvious what God was doing. God was said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a contract with you. And basically, this is, this is kind of gross, right? He cuts all the animals in half. And what they did, because they had a verbal society, we, we have lawyers and bankers that we go and we sign and we have witnesses and we do it that way. Their way that they did it was that they did it in an oral way and, and they said both people would walk through this sort of bloody mess of the two halves and as they were walking through, the thought on this is, if I don't fulfill my contract, I will be like this, cut in half. Ooh. You would get way better service from your auto mechanic. (laughs) And so this is what they did. And so Abram completely gets this. He goes, okay, God's going to make a contract with me. But then the story begins to change. And in verse 12, he says this. The sun was setting, and Abram fell into a deep sleep, and God gave him a close encounter. And there was a thick and dreadful darkness that came over him, And the Lord said to him, know for certain. And then he begins to tell him what the future is going to be like for this family that he's doubting that he's going to have. Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. That they'll be enslaved and they'll be mistreated. That's what the darkness is about. 
But I will punish the nation that serves them as slaves, and afterwards they come out, afterwards you will come out with great possessions. Hey, we know the end of the story, so we know this exactly happened. But Abram's sitting there in the middle of this dream going, wow, that's my future? And he says, and you, however, will go to your ancestors in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age, and in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back to you when the sins of the Amorite has reached its full measure. And the sun set, and the darkness fell, and there was fire, and there was smoke, and the Lord made a covenant to Abraham that he would give him this land. And there's a couple of things that are happening there. The first thing is this, is that God had not only given him the stars that he would look at, but he said, I want to give you something that's tangible in your culture, the thing that you know, so we have this sort of bloody trail that he's going to walk through, and it starts to get dark. And I don't know if you've ever had, it's not like some cheesy Halloween thing when you go, yeah, scream, lady, we know what's going to happen next. The guy's going to come out with a, you know. It, this was like something absolutely awesome that began to unfold. I don't think this comic quite does it. It was dark. And things that they didn't expect happened. lightning shot across the sky and the lightning actually stood still and there was this feeling that swept over Abram as God began to fold out his future and he said to him this is what's going to happen to you and he lays out everything that's going to happen to you it's going to be like this your kids are going to grow up and they're gonna, one of them is going to be a doctor, one of them is going to be a lawyer. And how's the, the nurse going to go? Well, you're gonna, the other one's going to be an Indian chief, right? And whatever the nursery rhyme is. And, and as they go, they're going to do this. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna make the newest, greatest thing that's better than the internet. And you're going to live to a ripe old age. And you're going to have your time in St. Vitale. It's going to be amazing. Where do you live? St. Vitale, sure. It, you're going to live in St. You live in St. Vitale. You're going to grow old together, and it's going to be amazing. And God gives you this picture of your whole future. And there's going to be some people who spoke ill of you, and I'm going to wipe them out. Oh. That's pretty personal, right? And God lays out 400 years of this, and, and He says, and, and "I want you to get this." Abraham had just been given some things, had God had showed him stuff, and he said, oh, God, I'm still doubting myself. And God comes and he says, hey, let me tell you that not only do I have my fingerprints all over your past, not only do I have my fingerprints all over your present, my fingerprints are all over your future. And it is already written, and it is already done. And God says, you know what? Would you overlay that over your doubt? Guess who is not important in this story? Abram. Guess who is important in this story? I am! I am the resurrection and the life. I am your, prov your provider. I am your protector. I am the lifter of your head. I am. Am. And all of a sudden, who I am is not so important. Because who he is, he's the writer of your story. And God wants <clears throat> Abram to know that. So he goes back to his contract that he was going to have with him. And in a usual thing, both people would walk through there. <clears throat> I think I wrecked something yelling. Whew. As he walked through, uh, as he was thinking he was going to walk through those things, and usually what happened when, when two people walked through, or if there was a king and a, and a commoner, only the commoner would walk through, and the king would stand by because that was too low for him to do. But in the story, what happens is, Abram doesn't even get to walk through. God just walks through. And I want you to think about that. As God begins to walk through, what he is saying to Abraham, what he is saying about his promises is this. 
if I don't fulfill my promises, I will be torn apart. That is how sure God is. That is what the promises of God are. And he says, I will be with you. I am your rear guard. I am. And, and this was, I don't think we can probably get how astonishing that was for Abram in that moment. That he thought, oh yeah, I know what this is. You know, this is this thing. God's going to walk, I'm going to walk through and God's going to say yes. And all of a sudden he realized, I, I actually am not even in this equation at all. God's fingerprints are all over my life, all over my future, and he walks through it, and he promises it. And God says, you know what? This is what you can do when you doubt. This is what you can overlay when you say, boy, I don't know about me. And God says, yeah, I don't know about you either, but... (laughs) Okay, that was maybe Aubrey. That wasn't so much God. Yeah. But this is who I am. And in this God encounter, folks, we learn something that I think all of us can grab a hold of every time we doubt. And and as you engage with God in your doubts, I want you to remember a couple of things. One first thing is this, is that he isn't somehow mad at you that you're doubting the second time and the third time and the fourth time. That he is looking to give you his truth about who he is so you can move forward in that truth. Because there's a lot of things you can look at when you doubt. And God says, I have one thing I need you to look at. I am. Who's the, what is the I am in your life right now that God's wanting to show you? 300 of them. But he wants to make it personal for you. He wants to overlay it over your doubts, your fears, your frustrations, your injustice, and say, I am. Let's, let's line the, shine the light of the, the New Testament over that. As, as I was thinking about just getting into this, there, I remembered a story I was sitting right where you guys are, Danica, and, and there was this lady who walked in, and I got on a mission trip with her about 20 years ago, and as I was seeing her walk in, I was thinking, what's her name? And, uh, you know, there's like a couple of thousand of you, and I don't remember everybody's name. And as I was and think, oh, that, and, and, and this is what God did. He's super funny. I just, I think it's very funny. He goes, I want you to go and say hi to her, and I want you to tell her, I know your name. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, but I don't know her name. <laughs> Who is this story about again? Oh, yeah, not me. Right, okay. So I walk over there, and uh, I said, hey. And she goes, yeah, I saw you looking at me as I was coming in, and I immediately felt guilt because I haven't been at church, and I should have done this, and I should have done that. And I said, hey, you know what? God wants to tell you, Leah, that he knows your name. And I'm going, Nice. <laughs> And she just burst into tears. Because she was thinking about all the stuff that she wasn't. And what was God saying? I am your great reward. I know your name. The silly pastor, not so much. God says, I know your name. I am your great reward. So let's shine the New Testament on this. If we're talking about that, we probably have to talk about um, the person who struggled the most with it seems to be Thomas. And uh, Jesus had just been resurrected. And the resurrected Jesus was a little different than the guy that trudged around uh, Jerusalem. He appears in places, right? This is is like the 2.0 He was going on here. And so Jesus appeared to some of the disciples. Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas said, you know what? Unless I put my hands in his fingernails, in in, in his palms and in the side, I'm not going to believe. And uh, all the people had seen him. All the disciples had seen him. And he was just like, ah, there's no way. And he gets a pretty bad rap because it's like one instance. You and I doubt all the time. And God 
in, in Jesus shows up in this room, and he looks at Thomas, and he says, come here. If I was Thomas, I'd be thinking, oh boy, blew that one, right? And he says, hey Thomas, would you just put your finger right here? I, I think, if my understanding is that in heaven, everybody's body will be perfect except the body of your Savior who died for you, because that mark remains. And he said, put your hand here, and put your hand here. And Thomas is doubting, turns to shouting, and he just says, my Lord and my God. And everything changes in Thomas's life. And he becomes the guy who takes the gospel. Some of you are of Indian descent. You can trace your gospel back to Thomas because he brought the gospel back to India. In fact, he was fearless in everything that he did. That was his close encounter with God was the moment that changed everything for him. And he actually died. This part is sort of gruesome. He actually died not wanting to recant the gospel, and they took uh, a stake and put it th- right through him and through his stomach. And you look and go, oh. But here's what I want you to think about. When that was happening on earth, friends, what was happening in heaven? What was Thomas's entrance into heaven? Doubting Thomas, terrible rap, right? God welcomes him in. Now, I want to give you two things that I want to close with, and then we're going to take some time to roll this. What did Thomas do that was incredibly helpful to himself when he was doubting? And the first thing is this, and it's just really basic. He showed up in the middle of his doubts. He didn't go binge on Instagram and put himself into a coma. He didn't go buy something to make himself feel better. He didn't go back to fishing. He didn't do all those other things. He showed up in the middle of his doubts. And the enemy is going to want to whisper in your ear and have you isolate yourself and go far away. Here's my encouragement to you. Show up in the middle of your doubts. God is not put off by them. He's actually, your doubts become the thing that strengthens your faith. Anything that you've experienced in your life that you're sure about in God probably came through trials, right? That's how you got to be who you are, is because you kept showing up in the middle of your doubts. The second thing that he did was this, is he hung out with good people that he had a long-term relationship with. And for some of you, you're going to have to start that long-term relationship. I have really felt stirred over this season that that we need to begin to grow in our relational stuff here at church. And and I've said this in a few ways. Guys, men, I'm really stirred for us that we would have a place where we can talk about important things with another man. Thomas had some guys that he could doubt with. And God met him, Jesus met him right where he was at, and he gave it. Do you think Thomas ever forgot that? Never! That picture is so emblazed in his mind. My Savior came to me and he said, hey, Thomas, would you just put your finger right here? My Lord and my God. Who do you have in your life that you can talk about the important things with, that you can doubt with, that you can deal with your doubts? God wants to meet you right where you're at. That's where your faith begins. It's where you honestly Come to him, and you show up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why why don't you do this? You can give the Lord a hand. Sure. Why don't you stand? And we're going to take a moment and do a couple of things. The first one is this. I'd like you to all bow bow your heads and close your eyes. And, And I want us to take a moment because there's probably something that God wants to speak to you about. There's probably something that he wants to just affirm. And it could be as simple as as an I am that he brings to your mind. It could be a picture. But we're going to take a moment and we're just going to all together online do this as well. We're just going to be quiet before our God and say, God, what do you want to say? What do you want to speak to us about?
Holy Spirit, would you come and just say it, whatever it is you want to say. Speak whatever it is you want to speak. I thank you, Lord, that you are compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithful through all generations. Would you just affirm what it is you want to affirm in your loved sons and daughters today? Thank you, Lord. Lord, I also ask that today as, as we come to you, that, that if there are, are people in the room who either needed need to kind of come back to you or never actually have made that decision and need to have that first encounter with you, with everybody's eyes closed, if that's you today, if you need to have, if you never had that, that first decision or you need to come back, without anybody looking around, would you just raise your hand up and I'll acknowledge it and you can put it down. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you. All right. So we're going to pray together. Even if in the quick thought of this morning you didn't get something, God wants to have a close encounter with you. He wants to speak who he is over you. So this week, allow him to do that. Let's pray together. Repeat after me if you online raise that hand. Or if you did it in person, you pray this with all your heart. Your whole church family is going to be praying with you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are the great I am. And you are also our Savior. Jesus, you died for us. We accept that sacrifice on our behalf. I thank you that today I have a new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give your Lord a hand. Amen. Well, we are just so happy that you've been able to join us this morning. And if you did today make that decision to follow Jesus, we just want to congratulate you, welcome you to the family, and we would like to help you take your next steps. And you can do that if you're on churchofthe-rock.live. Just click on Next Steps. Or if you're on any other platform, please visit our website, churchofthe-rock.ca slash decision. Tell us a little bit about yourself and a member of our team. We'll follow up with you and get you started on your next steps. Well, our next step now for the kids is Kids Rock. So let's go. tuning in. I'm Alfie. And I am Saul. And welcome to Kids Rock. Today's going to be a great day, so hang on to your seats, your pews, your pillows, whatever you're sitting on to watch us because it's going to be awesome. To start us off, we're going to have a little friendly competition of oh, who can flip their water bottle okay. and land it the most times. Go, go, go. Okay, I clearly won. Next. Easter songs in November. God's not okay. dead. He <laughs> is alive. God's <laughs> not dead. What, what, what? What are you doing? I'm starting Kids Rock. Uh, starting Kids Rock with 17 shots of espresso? What's going on? Uh, no. It's just that I saw in your day timer that you have a hair appointment in 30 minutes. <laughs> and you don't want to be late for that, so we got to speed things along. What? Hair appointment? <laughs> Did you forget that you had a hair appointment? No. I, I just know that hair appointments are, you know, they're not mandatory. They're, they're optional, you know, so. Uh, you know what? Uh, it says right here, today, mandatory appointment. No excuses, Psalms. You've got this. I believe in you. <laughs> you know, that doesn't even look like my handwriting. <laughs> I don't know who wrote that. Uh, was... You clearly wrote this. Uh, anyways, what were we doing? Oh, God's not dead. He's alive. Okay, Come on, God's are, not dead. Are you trying to distract things? I mean, you <sighs> clearly need a haircut. 
Are you afraid of getting your hair cut? Uh, yes, I'm afraid of getting haircuts. My whole family is afraid of getting haircuts. Are you happy? It's just a haircut. I mean, the haircutting people, they're really good. I mean, <sighs> they go to haircutting school and, well, you shouldn't let the fears of your family or the fears you have ruin your beautiful hair. You think my hair is beautiful? Whoa! Uh, you know, Psalms, I think you should join the kids today and watch today's Bible story. I think you might get lots out of it. All right. Well, kids, why don't we watch our Bible story together? When I wake up, when I wake up, I know that you are with me every step of the way. You're strong enough, you're strong enough to handle any fear that I face. Even things that scare me, cause they seem too big. Even all the hard things that make me want to quit. You're bigger than it all, and you're in charge of it. And I don't feel so worried when I look to you. exciting to show you. Check this out. Do you know what it is? It's a donut wall. I can put different donuts on these pegs and share them with my friends. Let's do it. We can put a powdered donut here. <laughs> so sugary. We can put a glazed donut all-time favorite, right here. We'll put a chocolate donut right here. And everyone loves chocolate. And 
a bacon donut. Don't knock it till you try it. Right here. And the all time best donut in the world, the sprinkle donut. And hold on a second. I might as well put sprinkles on everything. Hello, Zoe. Ho, ho. I heard some sprinkles fall, and I spy yummy donuts on that wall. Yes, Ollie. I made a wall of donuts to share with my friends, with, of course, lots of sprinkles. It's great to give good things. It's true. I know who made good things for you. Listen to this story. Just follow me through. Who? Who? Follow me through. Follow me through hell. I've got a Bible story for me and you. <gasps> well, hello, friends. I'm Aisha, and welcome to my cupcake food truck. I'm so happy to see you today. Do you want to see my latest creation? Ta da! <laughs> These are my good good garden cupcakes. Do you see all the different flowers on them? I am so thankful for pretty flowers and cupcakes. <laughs> Today's story is about some really good things to be thankful for. Are you ready to hear it? If you're ready for the story, on the count of three, yell, tell me a story. One, two, three, tell me a story. Okay, so today's true story from the Bible begins with a super amazing gift. Raise your hand if you like gifts. <laughs> you do? I do too. And when someone who loves you makes you a gift, it's even more special. Well, in the beginning of the world, God made something really big and really amazing. Do you know what it is? <laughs> That's right. God made the whole world. Wow. God made the earth for all of us to live on because God is good. But God didn't stop there. God made even more. Let's see what's in this gift. What is it? A flower. That's right. And did God make just one kind of flower? No. God made tall flowers and short flowers and yellow flowers and blue flowers and so many different and beautiful flowers for us to enjoy. When we look around and see all the different flowers God made, we can say, God is good. Say it with me. Who is good? God is good. But that's not all God made. Uh, uh oh, this one is jumping. What do you think is in this gift? What is it? Oh, yes, that's right, a frog. God made animals, but God didn't make just one kind of animal. God made sloths and butterflies and llamas and squirrels and alligators. Who made all the animals? That's right, God made all kinds of animals. When we look around and see all the different animals God made, we can say, God is good. Say it with me, who is good? God is good. But that's not all God made. Let's see what is in this gift. Do you know what it is? That's right, a person. God made people, and not just one person, but every person in the whole world. God made each of us different and wonderful. We look different, think different thoughts, speak different languages, and are able to do different things. When we look around and see all the people God made, we can say, God is good. Say it with me, who is good? God is good. God made the whole world and everything in it. 
Everywhere we look, we see good gifts that God made because God is good. <laughs> oh, hey there, Ollie. Tell me, who is good? God is good. Yes, it's true. Now let's hear it from you. Tell me, who is good? God is good. That's the truth, friends. You better believe it. Bye. So there's your story, and it's all true. God made lots of good things for you. Thanks, Ollie. Goodbye to you. Hoo, hoo. Wow, our whole world is filled with gifts from God. And when we look around and see them, we can say that God is good. I think I got the story. Did you get it? If you did, say got it. Get it? Got it! Good! I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go outside and look at all the amazing things that God made. Well, eating one of these sprinkled donuts, of course. I'll see you next time. Bye! What does fear feel like to you? Maybe it's butterflies fluttering in your stomach, or it might seem like cold fingers creeping up your spine. Fear can feel like a lump in your throat that makes it hard to swallow. Or it might chase thoughts round and round inside your head, refusing to stop. Enough! When you face something hard, fear can show up in a hundred different ways. It can threaten to stop you in your tracks. But you don't have to let fear be the boss of you. When fear shouts, you can't do it, stop. Take a deep breath. Listen for that still, quiet voice of God. God says, be strong and brave. Do not be afraid. Do not lose hope. I am the Lord your God. I will be with you everywhere you go. When you know that God is with you, you can keep going. You can walk straight through those fears. And when others see you choose to be brave, even when you're afraid, they can see God at work in your life. That's why courage is an amazing way to worship God with your life. Because worship is about more than just singing loud, it's all about living loud. Welcome to Story Lab. This week we're talking about courage while we take a look at the story of some spies who had a split decision on their mission report. Oh, and look out for this. Hey, I'm Amaya. And I'm Zeke. And we're talking about courage, which is being brave enough to do what you should even when you're afraid. So, let me get this straight. Fear is where courage starts? Yep. I could be a courage champion. What are you afraid of? Okay, super weird, but there's this bed post in my aunt's guest room I'm kind of scared of walking past. Um, okay, I mean, people are afraid of all kinds of things. I looked up some of the top fears. Like what? Number five, fear of getting laughed at. Ooh. <laughs> Number four, fear of thunder and lightning. Number three, fear of big dogs. Number two, fear of heights. And number one, fear of snakes and spiders. Now my heart's pounding. I know, right? When fear shows up, it can actually take over your body. Fear really does go straight for the control system. Mm-hmm. 
When you face a fear, your brain alerts your nervous system, which triggers the release of stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. This causes your blood pressure, heart rate, and breathing to increase. More blood flows to your limbs so you can throw a punch or run for your life. And some parts of your brain are so busy amping up your body that the thinking part of your brain can shut down. Wow. No wonder we make such terrible decisions when we're afraid. Yep, but there are things that we can do to face our fear. Like we can breathe. Deeply and slowly. And we can also ask questions about our fears. Like, what do I really think that bedpost is gonna do to me? <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, great job holding up the bed. You can even plan baby steps to face your fear, a little bit at a time. Hey, what are you afraid of? Um, crickets. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's in the box? Um, <laughs> a cricket. Oh, oh, this is great. You can face your fear right here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just gonna lift the box up really slowly. And then I'm just gonna open it really slowly. After the story. <laughs> well, okay. It's time for the story before the story. Today, we're in the fourth book of the Old Testament, Numbers. God promised to bless the whole world through Abraham's family, the Israelites, and give them a home in the land of Canaan. God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, leading them through the Red Sea. In the desert, God showed deep love by giving the Israelites food and water. God also gave them rules to show them how to love God and love others. At last, God led the people to the very edge of Canaan, the Promised Land. And that's where our story starts. Let's go! Hey everyone! Hi, Hi Brian. Brian! Okay, so about two years after crossing the Red Sea, the Israelites had finally made it to the very edge of Canaan, the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God told their leader Moses, Send some men to check out the land of Canaan. I am giving it to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of Israel's tribes. So Moses called a leader from each of the 12 tribes. Shemua, Shaphat, Caleb, Igal, Joshua, Palti, Gadiel, Gadi, Amiel, Sether, and Nabi, and Jewel. So once the gang was all together, Moses laid out a super secret spy mission for these guys. I want you to see what Canaan is like. Are there a lot of people or just a few? Are they strong or weak? Do their towns have high walls? Oh, and study the land. Is the soil rich or poor? Are there trees? Now bring back some of the food that grows there if you can. So just like that, these 12 men snuck into Canaan just as God had instructed. Now, for about six weeks, they traveled the length of the country and saw the places where Abraham and his family had lived hundreds of years before. On their return journey, the spies cut a bunch of grapes so ginormous, it had to be carried on a pole between two men. You can bet that when they showed up in the Israelite camp at the end of 40 days, <laughs> it made a pretty big stir. At first, the spies gave a glowing report. Canaan is super awesome! The land is filled with so many good things! It's practically flowing with milk and honey! Yeah, check out these grapes! <laughs> but we can never go there. The people who live there are powerful! Their cities have high walls! The people are like giants! Even though the spies had seen many good things, they were stuck on their fears. Only Joshua and Caleb were brave enough to speak up. We should go up and take the land. We can certainly do it. No way. They're, they're, they're stronger than we are. They're so ginormous that we look like crickets to them. The Israelites chose to listen to fear 
They went into complete panic mode, convinced they would be destroyed. They even begged to go back to Egypt. Joshua and Caleb tried to speak to them. The land is very good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll lead us there. He will give it to us, but we've got to obey him. Yeah, don't be afraid of the people in the land. The Lord is with us. Instead of listening to Joshua and Caleb, the Israelites talked about killing them. But in the midst of all this chaos, the glory of God appeared at the tent of meeting. God spoke to Moses. How long will they refuse to believe in me? Moses begged God to have mercy on the Israelites. Lord, your love is great. Forgive the sin of these people, just as you've done so many times already. I have forgiven them, just as you asked. But not one of these people will see the land I promised to give them. But my servant Caleb has a different spirit. He follows me with his whole heart, so I will bring him into the land. Joshua was also allowed to enter the land. God did forgive the Israelites for turning away again, but there were big consequences. Instead of forging ahead into Canaan, the Israelites ended up wandering and stuck in the wilderness for almost 40 years. Now, by that time, only Joshua and Caleb were still living to lead the new generation, their children, into Canaan. And fast forward, they did. At the end of 40 years, Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land. And right away, they came up to the walled city of Jericho. But with God's help, they faced their fears and those impossibly strong walls came tumbling down. But <laughs> that's another story for another day. Wow. I mean, so the spies' fears were real. I mean, their enemies were really strong. Yep. But Joshua and Caleb knew that God had already promised to help them. Yeah, they had to make a choice to do the right thing, even when everyone else was giving in to fear. So, what's our part in the story? Well, fear is totally normal. But God can still help you be brave and do the right thing. Yeah, maybe you're in a group where a popular girl is saying mean things about another kid. Your friends might be afraid to speak up because they don't want to get laughed at but you can be brave and you can speak up because that's not right. Or maybe the fire alarm goes off and one of your friends is really panicked. That happened in my school. Yeah, you can be the one to stop and help them calm down. Right, you never have to face fear alone. When you believe in Jesus and follow him, God's spirit lives in you and can give you the courage to do the right thing. Even if you are afraid. And that's something awesome to hold on to. Oh, for sure. See you next time. So here's the thing. You can do what you should, even when others are afraid. Want to face that fear right now? Um, sure. I mean, <laughs> what's one giant evil cricket going to do to me? <laughs> Baby steps. OK. Just going to pick it up real slowly. OK, remember your breathing. Release the cricket. <laughs> thanks for joining us in the Story Lab. See you next time. Hey kids, thanks for joining us today. We hope you had fun and you learned that God is always with us, especially when we're afraid of, you know, maybe doing some things. Yeah, Joshua and Caleb are so much braver than me. I mean, I was afraid to get a haircut. You know, and you're afraid of teddy bears too. But you know what, Psalms and kids? Joshua and Caleb weren't brave on their own. They were brave because God was with them. Mm -hmm. You know something, friends? When I remember that God is with me, I feel so much braver. Well, yeah, that's because we only see a part of the picture. God sees the entire picture. Mm -hmm. And knowing that should encourage you, and it should encourage you, friends, too. So we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Hey, Psalms, I'll come with you to get a haircut. Yeah, I'd yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, let's go.